uh, what does it mean to understand biological systems and uh, how can we uh, uh, uncover direct causal mechanisms? And I would like to outline one approach in terms of a hierarchy. If you want to understand the system, it's hard to understand it if you don't even know its components. So first you would like to identify components and that's relatively easy these days with uh, the technologies that we have, we can we can find a parts list, the famous metaphor from the sequencing of the human genome. We can measure these components across many conditions, and that's beginning to be more limited. Certain components, such as nucleic acids, are fairly easy to measure in high throughput, while other components that are equally important, perhaps more important, such as metabolites and proteins, tend to be harder to, to quantify, certainly their spatial localization and interactions. And then we may want to correlate the components. We may want to correlate messenger RNAs or various things that we measure in compute associations. And that's quite easy and commonly done with everything that we measure. We can easily compute various forms of uh, association, whether that's mutual information, Pearson correlation, Euclidean distance, or some other measure. It's conceptually the, the same idea. Uh, then we may want to infer causal associations. Now, if these causal associations are indirect, it is actually surprisingly easy to infer them. You might think inferring causal association is the pinnacle, the hardest thing to do. Not necessarily. I will give you some examples, at least in model organisms, where indirect causal associations are rather easy to identify but they're also not very informative and not very useful. Now, direct causal interactions are much harder generally to identify, and that will be the, uh, a big emphasis in the presentation. Uh, how do we go from indirect to, to much more direct uh, uh, mechanisms? And ultimately, the thing that happens rather rarely and we celebrate is if from all of that we can distill uh, common underlying principles that govern emergent behavior, most of biological functions are emergent behaviors, uh, that's wonderful um, and uh, happens rarely. Certainly doing four and five is not equivalent to doing six, but to the extent that we can do five much better, I think we, we are also closer to being able to uh, identify uh, principles governing biological behaviors. So let me start by giving you an example of how you might very easily infer indirect causality. Um, this is a data set that I generated when I was a graduate student about uh, your career stage. If you have any cell culture that you're growing, whether mammalian or yeast or any other uh, condition, you can change one factor at a time and you can measure downstream results, such as the abundance of messenger RNAs. And what you measure, if you change only one factor in your system, is a direct uh, result. It's, it's causally generated by the factor that you change. So if you, if you put glucose to your culture of cells and then you measure messenger RNAs levels, you're going to find that glucose causes some messenger RNAs to increase in abundance and others to decrease, and in this case, uh, I was studying the uh, the growth rate of, of cells uh, in uh, and its association with the abundance of uh, many transcripts in different conditions. But I want to illustrate the limitation of this kind of indirect inferences with a case study of a very important biological system relevant to human health, and that is the regulation of cholesterol which we all know is um, associated with um, atherosclerosis and multiple morbidity in, in the human population. What is commonly done these days in the post-genomic era is to identify multiple SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms across the population uh, in many, many, many individuals, and then we can associate them, compute uh, based on a model, we can compute some association between those and phenotypes of interest, various diseases, uh, they can, we can associate them with messenger RNA levels and so on and so forth. So let's just assume that we have done one such study, they're usually called genome-wide association studies, and that study 
resulted in two very confident conclusions that are, we are going to assume here for the sake of argument, that they are bona fide causal associations. We know that's God given truth. That SNP X is associated with high cholesterol, causes high cholesterol. And also, we find that SNP X causes increased abundance of the messenger RNA for HMG CoA reductase. HMG CoA reductase is one of the key enzymes regulating uh, cholesterol biosynthesis, and the enzyme is inhibited uh, with multiple pharmaceuticals that are used to treat atherosclerosis and that for, for many, many years have been the, the most profitable pharmaceuticals on the market. It's a very important uh, regulatory uh, step in cholesterol biosynthesis. So my, my question for you is, from, from this information, would you know that those two observations are related? Is that formally tr correct or not? Um, I think you would have to also show that um, an increase in HMG CoA reductase causes high cholesterol. Like, just those two statements alone doesn't show the relationship. That's right. So it seems likely that this might be one possibility, that this particular SNP increasing the messenger RNA might contribute to more cholesterol being synthesized. But that's certainly not the only possibility consistent with the data. And in fact, there are uh, many, many possible models that one can uh, write down that are all consistent with these observations. In particular, it could be that SNP X, which here I denote with, uh, with X, causes the increased uh, levels of transcription factor I that then facilitates the synthesis of the messenger RNA Y. It could be that SNP X actually activates another transcription factor J that then activates the transcription factor I that then causes the induction of the messenger RNA. Or it could be that the SNP actually increases the activity of kinase J that then phosphorylates transcription factor I that then induces HMG CoA reductase transcription. And could be a zillion other similar linear models. Or it could be also branched models, as I have indicated on the bottom, where you have SNP X causing increased activity of kinase J that then phosphorylates the mediator complex. And the mediator complex, if interacting with transcription factor K, induces the transcription of HMG CoA reductase. If, on the other hand, the phosphorylated mediator complex interacts with transcription factor L, it suppresses. And could be that one team has more patients, one, one team of researchers analyzes more patients in which the first branch of the pathway is active and finds positive association. And another team activates another subgroup of patients in which the second interaction is, is happening and finds a negative association. And not only that these things can be happening one at a time, all of these zillion models can happen simultaneously, in principle, the, uh, uh, theoretically considering. So even if we have these bona fide, very high confidence, indirect causal associations, our ability to interpret them is quite limited because there are many, many, many possibilities consistent with them. And we cannot rigorously exclude that uh, any, any of them without doing more experiments. We have to to go to a more direct association, because if we actually had evidence that SNP X is directly regulating any of these components here on the slide, that will be much, much more straightforward to interpret, much more invariant. So while it might be easy to find the causal association of adding glucose and having induced transcription of many genes, Finding the mechanism that is causing that induced transcription is much harder here, what I'm showing on the left. And this picture on the left traditionally has been drawn based on literature analysis of lots of lots of individual low throughput experiments and has been generally lagging very much behind our ability to generate large scale data sets uh, and, in, and just 
uh, infer associations, including uh, indirect causal associations. So one way to try to bridge the two worlds is to try to find out regulatory networks is. And here I want to discuss a little bit uh, what regulatory networks might be and what they need. Uh, going back to the beginning of, of, of our class when we discussed some methods for inferring such networks. Now, the simplest uh, type of uh, network that we might build is simply by correlating messenger RNAs, their abundances across multiple conditions. And say that the nodes are the messenger RNAs and the edges are their correlations, we may choose to threshold them. So if the correlation is above a certain threshold, then we put an edge. If, if it's uh, below that threshold, we don't have an edge. And obviously that's somewhat arbitrary. And obviously that kind of um, network doesn't correspond to direct mechanisms or regulatory interactions, it just tells us which messenger RNAs tend to covariate together. And many of these uh, covariations are going to be indirect. It is not going to be that messenger RNA I is causing the uh, levels of messenger RNA J, but rather the two might be caused by another transcription factor. And people with the first approach to try to distinguish a little bit those direct from indirect um, associations is to make a model and based on that model we can say if we account for the interactions between this subset of um, messenger RNAs we might be able to deconvolve and throw out these indirect associations. So what kind of model you're going to make if you don't know the underlying interactions and if you don't know the functional relationships between them? Well, the simplest thing is let's just model everything with lines, linear relationships. And should be emphasized that this is done out of simplicity and convenience rather than because we think that this is really what's, what's going on in, in the system. Uh, and the corresponding uh, associations, if you were to do it with a linear model, are called partial correlations, and that corresponds to essentially inferring a multivariate normal distribution over the messenger RNAs. There were many, many, many papers published uh, on this uh, variation in early 2000s. And as we have already discussed in class, we can do a little bit better than that we can uh, relax the assumption of linearity potentially by using mutual information. And that allows us to um, account for uh, arbitrary nonlinear interactions in principle between the variables that you're analyzing, assuming that we can compute the mutual information, which as we have discussed in class, is not trivial. It's actually very difficult to reliably estimate joint distributions from uh, finite data, especially noisy data. Now, let's say you do that. Let's say you've done Arachne uh, to the best data set you could generate, and you find that the mutual information between RNAi and RNAj is very high. Why do you think that might be? Can you, can you give me some possibilities as to why that mutual information can be very high? Or if the genes are co-regulated? Exactly. So a very simple and realistic case when messenger RNAs co-vary very strongly is if they have the same transcription, if, if their synthesis and their degradation are regulated by the same molecules. If their, if their transcription is induced by the same set of transcription factors, their degradation is mediated by the same set of uh, regulators, then they're going to cover it very strongly. And finding such messenger RNAs doesn't quite correspond to our idea of finding regulators because uh, or regulatory network because we would like to know a molecule that is causing another molecule to do something rather than two molecules that are both doing more or less the same uh, because they're listening to the same music, so to speak. And the really big elephant in the room here uh, when we try to infer gene regulatory networks is that most of the really important regulators are 
rarely measured. They're unobserved variables. They're, they're confounders. What do we mean by that? Uh, the regulation is usually not exerted directly by messenger RNAs, but by their protein products, which then get post-translationally modified and get localized to particular places. And it is that active form of the regulator that is exerting the regulatory effect. So what, what can you do about that? Uh, my idea how to deal with it, and it's certainly not something that I invented. Many, many people have, uh, have worked on, on this problem. Uh, but the thing that really resonated with me when I was, uh, again, graduate student um, in New York or your stage, was that uh, I'm just going to uh, distinguish what I know from what I don't know, and I'm going to acknowledge that the abundance of the messenger RNA for a transcription factor is different from the activity of that transcription factor being post-translationally modified and localized in the nucleus which I did not know. So uh, my idea was, with, uh, again, not just mine, many people's idea, the thing that I did, was to model the, the activities of transcription factors as latent variables. So here I'm showing this very simple bipartite network where with two layers, one layer, the bottom one are the genes, and the top layer are their regulators. They can be transcription factors. They can also be molecules that regulate their degradation, uh, that regulate their abundances. And some transcription factors regulate subsets of messenger RNAs and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea of inferring such a network is twofold, both to find which regulator regulates which subset of genes, and then to find what are the activities of that regulator. So, how, how, we might, how we might be able to do that? The thing that they did was to decompose the matrix of measured messenger RNA levels, shown here on the left, into a product of two matrices. One matrix uh, containing the activities of the regulators, and these can be highly nonlinear functions of, uh, of the actual abundances of, of the regulators. Uh, and to another matrix which describes the connectivity of the network, it's adjacency matrix. That's, that's the, uh, the, the technical term used to describe uh, the matrix that specifies the edges between the nodes of a network. And this boils down to a matrix decomposition problem as I have as written here at the bottom, G, the matrix G will be decomposed into the product of two matrices, R and C. What do you think? Does this problem have a solution, a unique solution? First, does it have a solution? And B, does it have a unique solution or does it have many solutions? What do you think? It has to have many solutions. Many solutions? Exactly. So this is ill posed problem. There would be infinite number of solutions <laughs> consistent with it without knowing something more about, about it to constrain it. Now, what do we know about the system that we can assume because it's true rather than uh, because it's computationally convenient to, to assume it? Uh, so in this case, uh, the assumption that uh, I felt very comfortable making is that the network is relatively sparse, meaning that not every transcription factor regulates every uh, messenger RNA, and we know that's generally the case. So if you make that assumption, uh, you can uh, you can formulate the problem mathematically so that it becomes solvable. In this particular case, uh, I um, I reduce the problem to finding a rotation matrix that rotates the singular value decomp decomposition of the data in such a way that we can find both the adjacency matrix and um, and the activities of the various regulators. Uh, this is the actual algorithm that implements it. I will not attempt to describe it for the sake of time, uh, and uh, because it will become a little bit too technical beyond the scope of, of this class, but it's certainly uh, uh, something that is, is published, implemented, and you can read more about it if you're interested in how it works. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of plots of, of how it works uh, as, as a demonstration of how we might be able to validate something like this. Uh, in this case, 
uh, I simulated data from in silico networks, not unlike what was done in the Arachne paper. And then I used various um, algorithms, including this one that I developed as a graduate student, it's called RC Web, uh, to infer the topology of these networks, and then I correlated the inferred topology of the network to the actual topology that, that produced the data. Uh, and I found that generally RC Web performed better than, than other competing methods in terms of the accuracy of the inference and also had very favorable scaling with the complexity of the problem. So when you're developing algorithms for a large scale data, you always have to be concerned not only with uh, their accuracy, but with the ability to compute something practical with, with um, given finite computing resources. And uh, certainly the scalability was very favorable here. So towards the end of uh, my PhD, uh, I had uh, concluded that uh, quantitative approaches uh, uh, can be fruitful and quite fun when applied to biological systems. I was also somewhat disappointed with the limitations of, bar, of bipartite transcriptional networks. Uh, and I was very interested, among other things, uh, in measuring uh, what's important, not just what's really convenient to measure, but can we uh, also begin to characterize the, the regulators. And, uh, and I'm going to suggest here one one of the possible ways very difficult uh, but perhaps possible way how we, we might directly uh, infer uh, causal interactions uh, direct causality in biological systems and the idea is kind of simple if we can observe the biological systems of interest under enough number of configurations we might simply take the subset of cases where the only things that change are the molecules of interest. In other ways, this is subsetting the data in such a way that we have the ideal controlled experiment. What do we normally do, let's say, when, when, when stakes are very high and we really want to know the truth? We randomize our subjects or our samples into groups and between those those groups we want to have only one factor that is varying because in that case it is relatively simple to assign whatever differences between that we see between groups to that one factor that is different so in this case if we had uh, millions of observations um, of the, the the molecules in, in in cells across different configurations we can just take the subset of those observations in which um, everything except for the, the levels of kinase I and J is the same. So that means that we effectively control for our confounders. So that whatever effect they're having, that effect is going to be the same in all of the samples that you're considering, except for the sample for, for, for the activities of kinase I and J. And then we can ask whether the joint distribution of the activities of these two kinases I and J is simply product of their marginal distributions. And if we could do that, then uh, we can rigorously uh, determine whether the two kinases are actively, are directly activating, phosphorylating each other or not, uh, without making any assumptions. So this is what the fancy math here is, is describing. I try to describe it in, in, in plain English. Uh, it's hard to do. You, you really need to have a lot of data and you need to have data that can be subsetted in that way. And instead of just taking the, the joint distributions, you may want to look at the conditional covariances or other measures of association that might be more tractable. Uh, and that to, to make it more tractable, again, one needs to, to uh, derive algorithms so it can be able to make this inference with limited data without uh, making any assumptions. And ideally, all of that should be done within a closed cycle where uh, after we have done some measurements and we have learned something about the system, then we can use that knowledge to better design our next set of experiments and keep iterating until we reduce the uncertainty. 
So well, let me see how we are doing in terms of time. I think quite well. Maybe maybe it's a good time to pause here and ask if you have questions. Uh, on the plot that you showed uh, comparing your model to other uh, models for, um, I guess, inferring the connections between uh, those different genes, what were the, the, you, I, the solid lines were labeled, but what were the dotted lines in that figure? Uh, the dotted lines corresponded to, let me go here, corresponded to to different number of uh, uh, of observed configurations of, of the data. Okay, thanks. I was wondering what kinds of computer programs are suitable for this level of analysis. Uh, you can write the code in any uh, language that you choose, whether Python or R or MATLAB or C. The language, it's not so important. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the more important thing is the algorithm, and then that algorithm can be implemented in, in various languages. But almost any, any modern language will have the capability of, uh, of doing that. And then in terms of algorithms, I don't think that this kind of analysis that I'm discussing here has been implemented uh, uh, on biological data in, in a particularly convincing uh, high-scale way. In large part, I would say, because the required data, both in terms of uh, what is being measured and the accuracy of those measurements uh, uh, have been lacking. Hello, Dr. Slavos. I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, th these experiments are done in cultures of cells. I wonder if the uh, messenger RNA or the genes or whatever get affected um, in the body. Like, how, and do people mitigate these um, differences? The experiments don't have to be done in, in cell culture. They certainly can be done with human cells extracted from humans, from patients. Uh, there is, uh, that's not a limitation. Many, oftentimes, the study is easier and cheaper to do with cell culture, but none of the things that they have said so far or that they will say in the, in the second part of my presentation is limited to uh, uh, cell cultures. It, everything can be done with human patient samples. But, but you, you still take out the cells from the human and you culture them um, ex vivo, no, right? It, you don't need no? to culture them. Oh, okay. Why? You, you so, so the idea here will be, so if you, if you take cells, uh, assuming here we're doing single cell analysis, so let's take, take, let's say you take a small biopsy from a patient uh, that corresponds to 10 million cells. 10 million cells is actually a tiny, tiny biopsy. If you analyze these 10 million cells at the single cell level, what you're gonna find is that uh, each and every cell is different in some ways, sometimes because of uh, uh, systematic factors, their local environment, different signals that they receive, there would be different states and different types of cells, sometimes because of uh, perhaps more stochastic fluctuations within these cells. But that, that will give you a lot of diversity and you can think of each cell being subjected to a different kind of perturbation. You can sort of think of that uh, heterogeneity that normally exists in the human body that exists right now in each part of my body as a form of perturbation. And then when the analysis that I'm describing is conceptually equivalent to choosing the subset of perturbations in which the molecules under study are varying and they're, they're changing, but the other ones are not. And that gives you the ideal controlled experiment if you could if you could find that subset. Now that's not easy to do, and that's why one might have to mitigate, one might have to relax a little bit the constraints on, on this analysis, and and there is need for for very clever algorithms that can do this efficiently. But uh, in its purest form, this analysis is very simple conceptually, just hard to implement both in terms of the quality of the measurements required and the scale of those measurements.
Okay, I, I was just wondering if um, just the act of taking a biopsy, th does that affect the cells? Like, I, I would imagine that not being, in, like, in, in, in the host, like, being just grown outside of the body, that would, you know, mess up the, you know, actual representation of what happens in the body. Absolutely. So if you take them out of the body and you grow them, yes, but you don't have to grow them. So, so what I'm suggesting is that you take a biopsy, uh, in principle, that's one of the possibilities, certainly not the only one, but you take a biopsy and then you freeze the cells to negative 80 Celsius before they have had any chance to change. That would be one approach. And now, can you do that practically so that nothing changes? Uh, you can do your best. Uh, and uh, will the cells change during that period? Perhaps, uh, but the aspiration is always to uh, to decrease the magnitude of those changes, and some things may change more than other things. It is highly unlikely that the cells are going to have enough time and energy to degrade proteins. Protein degradation requires substantial amount of energy and takes time to do, so proteins are highly unlikely to change, in, at least in abundance during sample collection. Their localization might change much faster, uh, messenger RNAs might be more susceptible to change more quickly. But again, that's, uh, that's a well appreciated problem of how do you collect the samples with the least amount of artifacts. And there always are artifacts to some degree or another. Uh, but uh, there are many clever approaches and many people who have devoted uh, their careers and efforts in trying to come up with ways to, to minimize those changes. And I would say that there are good options out there that uh, that's not uh, a huge problem in in many cases of course it, it is a problem but it's uh, it's not precluding the feasibility of, of extracting useful information from from such samples thank you Hi, Dr. other Sala. questions yeah uh you mentioned that you're going to need a very large data set for this algorithm to be effective. Mm -hmm. Is all that data collected from your lab or are there collaborators that are also collecting that data? Anybody can do that. Ideally, uh, we have that being organized as a global collaborative effort. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to talk during the second part of my talk, uh, uh, my presentation about methods that we have developed to collect these data, but who, who uses th these methods in what experimental designs, in what shape and fashion, that very much uh, depends on resources and interest and availability. And ideally, if this kind of uh, proposal is to, uh, to be successful at a large scale, that would require that it's adopted by, by many groups. Uh, it's very hard to claim that somebody is successful if they're the only ones doing it. Uh, it's it's when you're a pioneer and you begin doing something at the beginning, you tend you and your group tend to be among the first doing it. But ultimately, if the thing is to become really influential, you need to be able to engage many other uh, smart people, many other good groups in, in doing that. And especially if it involves large scale data generation, uh, that would certainly require many collaborators and, and lots of resources. Uh, and, and in, in this case, I, I aim my presentation not specifically to things that uh, uh, we are doing in, in my lab, but more generally as, uh, as a presentation with pedagogical purpose to, to illustrate some, some ideas and to, um, and to discuss concepts that we already uh, covered in class. Other questions? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we might be able to measure more of the variables that are usually unobserved, uh, specifically when it comes to measuring them in, in tiny samples taken from patients, uh, such as uh, single cells. And many of the regulators in the cell tend to be proteins, and particularly their post-translationally modified forms. Uh, so it's worthwhile considering what are the options of, um, of measuring them. Uh, for, many, for many decades, uh, the only methods that could measure proteins in single cells and the main methods uh, uh, relied on antibodies. Uh, 
But antibodies tend to have, many of them tend to have limited specificity in the sense that antibody recognizes a particular epitope and that epitope might be present um, in other proteins as well. Um, or it could be that the antibody recognizes other epitopes as well, and especially if these other epitopes are present in very abundant proteins, the specificity of that antibody can be compromised. The other weaknesses, the other major weakness of antibody-based methods is that they have failed to scale to analyzing multiple proteins per sample. Uh, after decades of work, uh, we can still measure a few dozens, maybe up to a hundred proteins per sample, but, but not more than that. And I was interested uh, when I started my uh, group at Northeastern uh, 2015 in developing mass spec approaches to, uh, to be able to, to make such measurements in single cells. And here I summarize the, the methods that uh, we have developed in, in a single slide that they can easily spend an hour explaining. Uh, but I'll summarize in, in very conceptual terms. Uh, first, we need to somehow isolate the single cells, and this isolation can be done by a variety of methods. The one that is most practical in most cases is by fax sorting them into a multi-well plate. Again, there are many, many other possibilities. And then we needed to develop methods for preparing the samples in tiny volumes. Conventionally, samples for mass spectrometry analysis are um, lies using chemicals that are incompatible with the mass spec analysis itself, so they have to be removed. And if you try to remove chemicals from tiny samples, you tend to lose the, the proteins from these tiny samples. So we came up with methods that don't require these samples to be cleaned up and whose volume can be, be miniaturized. And then the proteins are usually digested to peptides because peptides are easier to analyze by mass spectrometry. Then the peptides are labeled um, with barcodes. And these barcodes covalently label each peptide. And if we use uh, one barcode per single cell, then every peptide from that single cell gets the same barcode. Once they're labeled, they can be mixed. And we also mix them with sample that is comprised of larger number of cells because that helps to reduce losses from proteins adhering on various surfaces. After that, the mixed barcode samples are separated on chromatography. The reason why we do that is because if we inject uh, the peptides from uh, a group of, from mammalian samples, uh, from mammalian uh, cells into a mass spec instrument, there will be millions of ions detected and we, the instrument will not be fast enough to analyze these ions and determine what are the peptide sequences, what do they correspond to, and so on. So to reduce the complexity of what the instrument sees, we have to use various methods to separate the peptides so that we have fewer peptides entering the instrument at the same time. Of course, what actually enters the instrument are ions because mass spectrometry works with ions rather than molecules. And then the technology allows to see all of the peptides um, that have the same sequence uh, and have received those barcodes. Uh, the peptides with the same sequence that come from different single cells will correspond to a particular ion cluster that then can be isolated and fragmented in such a way that the barcodes become distinguishable and can be used to quantify the abundance of that particular peptide across all of the single cells analyzed. And the peptide fragments can be used to determine what is the sequence of the peptide. So that's the, the big picture, how the experimental design works. And there have been essential computational aspects to optimizing um, uh, both the, the many parameters that go into controlling the uh, acquisition of this data and also computational methods to enhance our ability to identify the peptide sequences by using additional information such as the retention time of the peptides and to further be able to interpret the data. Um, are there any questions on, on the big picture? Professor Slava, this is Ashley. Um, what exactly do you mean by, like, what is what does barcoding the sample mean? So the barcoding is done by uh, molecules that are known as isobaric mass tags. Uh, 
Okay. These, uh, and, and just for everybody else to explain this, is isobaric, isobaric meaning they have the same mass. So even though we have different tags, all of these tags have the same molecular weight. And because they have the same molecular weight, when we attach the different tags to the same peptide sequence, we end up with molecules having the same mass. Therefore, they appear as a single cluster during as they enter the mass spec instrument during the first scan. But when broken, they break in distinct ways, the different tags, and then we can distinguish them and quantify them separately. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Other questions? All right. So does it work? All of this, is, uh, the beginning the beginning efforts were actually done by co-op students at, at Northeastern undergraduate students, and these data are produced by undergraduate uh, co-op students at Northeastern. Uh, so if you have something new, you always want to test it and see whether it makes sense or not. And ideally, you don't test it by seeing how reproducible it is, because you can have perfectly reproducible artifacts. Reproducibility and accuracy are very different things. It's good to have reproducible things, but reproducible things can be wrong. So in this case, we wanted to test it with something orthogonal and something orthogonal uh, as a method to measure proteins in single cells reliably without the issue of low specificity and so on and so forth, is to measure fluorescence from, from fluorescent proteins. So in this case, we had mCherry and IRFP, infrared fluorescent protein, being expressed in um, uh, mammalian cell line. These were breast cancer cells. Uh, we could measure the fluorescence on a fax sorter, and then the sorted cells were also analyzed by uh, Scope MS at the time, a few years ago. And we found that the two measurements correlated, so that gave us confidence that uh, we might be able to further improve the method and, and get quantitative data from it. Um, and I'm going to tell you about um, more about the application of this method in the context of a study that uh, a graduate student um, in my group uh, led, Harrison Speck. And that study started with a very simple question as to the determinants of macrophage polarization. Macrophages are cells of the innate immune system, as we have actually discussed a number of times uh, during our class, that they're present in most tissues in your bodies. And what is remarkable about macrophages is that they tend to have many different guises. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, they can, depending on uh, various cytokines present and the extracellular matrix and other cues from the environment, uh, they can have different phenotypes, molecular and functional properties. For example, some macrophages uh, can be pro-inflammatory. They stimulate the immune system, they attack and eat bacteria, while other macrophages are exactly the opposite. They tend to be anti-inflammatory and they might repress the immune response. And both of these functions can be very functional in the context of, of um, of health and macrophages performing their functions in the organism. The pro-inflammatory one is obviously associated with um, the immune response and responding to various types of infections. Uh, it's performed by macrophages that are classically um, called M1 macrophages for M1 polarized macrophages. And the other function can be very important in preventing autoimmune diseases. Uh, such as arthritis, uh, macrophages can prevent the immune system from inappropriately attacking the cells of the host, your own organism. But of course, that function, the immunosuppressive function, can be um, uh, usurped by cancer cells, and it is commonly one of the uh, mechanisms that cancer uses to evade the immune system by surrounding itself with such uh, uh, inhibitory uh, macrophages that uh, help suppress the uh, immune response and prevent immune cells from reading the body from the cancer. So the question that we wanted to answer is whether macrophages um, have the inherent propensity to become polarized, whether they can get polarized if we don't provide cytokines or if we differentiate them in vitro, in the absence of cytokines, they might still 
show uh, a degree of polarization. So to address this question, we did an in vitro differentiation experiment from a cell line by adding a chemical, PMA in this case, uh, the to a monocytic cell line, the monocytes differentiated in the course of 72 hours to macrophage-like cells. And then these macrophage-like cells were analyzed both by um, single cell mass spectrometry and by uh, 10x genomics, which is one of the uh, very powerful high throughput uh, methods for single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, it's a commercialized version of, um, <clears throat> of DROPSIC that was developed um, at Harvard Medical School and at the Broad Institute uh, a few years ago. Um, I'm going to, let me see, how are we doing in terms of time? We have time, so I can explain the design. So, as, as I previously mentioned, each single cell will get its own barcode and that then can be used to quantify independently the, the protein abundances. So, we, the, the sorted single cells were labeled with these barcodes as shown here in the table. And in addition, each set contained a reference sample that uh, was used to, to be able to integrate data from multiple scope to sets into, into the same matrix and contain the, the carrier sample comprised of, uh, of 200 mixed cells, monocytes and macrophages that facilitates uh, the analysis by mass spectrometry. And the first time you get data, you should always question the quality of that data. So we spent much time thinking about metrics that might indicate uh, whether the data are useful for analysis and indicate possible problems in the data. And uh, one well, um, well validated and widely used method to evaluate uh, protein measurements by mass spectrometry is the degree to which different peptides originating from the same protein provide consistent quantitation. So if we have different peptides that originate from the same protein, they should change in a similar way between different single cells. And we can quantify that variability by computing a coefficient of variation. That's a normalized measure of, of their variability. And what we can see here is that the um, quantification variability tends to be lower for the single cells compared to control wells. And the control wells are wells that received all experimental treatment that single cells did, but uh, they did not receive a single cell. And based on this analysis and other types of um, quality control analysis, we were able to establish that most of the single cells processed through the pipeline um, were suitable for further analysis, while a few of them uh, appeared to, to have uh, too noisy data or to have failed for whatever reason, and that's the uh, magenta tail of the distribution, and they were discarded from further analysis. Uh, one very important aspect that we had to improve in this analysis uh, will be illustrated here with, with these cartoons, and that has to do with the efficiency uh, of sampling um, peptides by, by mass spectrometry. So I already mentioned in the, in, in the introductory slide that um, the barcoded peptides are separated by chromatography before they're analyzed from, by, mass, by mass spec. And each peptide eludes from the chromatographic column over a period of at least a few seconds. And that elution peak here is being drawn as this, um, uh, as these curves colored in, in blue or orange. The blue corresponds to one peptide, the orange corresponds to another peptide. And then during a particular period of time, the instrument is going to select that peptide uh, for further analysis, for fragmentation and determining its, its structure by tandem mass spectrometry. And as you can see from the graph uh, from the panel on the left, if the selection happens very early, then you are going to sample a very small amount of that peptide, and therefore we might not have enough material to determine 
the composition of, of that peptide, what the sequence is, and to quantify it. If it's sampled in the middle, while avoiding sampling any other peptides, that can result in optimal um, sampling that maximizes the copy numbers of that particular peptide that are analyzed and the purity of the MS2 spectrum. And then there is another problem that might happen is if at the time when you are sampling the blue peptide, the orange one is coiluting and falls within the sampling window, we might co-isolate both the blue and the orange peptide. And that results in hybrid spectra that um, undermine the quantification and also undermine the ability to identify the sequence of, of the peptide. So these things are desirable to minimize. Uh, and they were an important part of what we had to optimize in the experiments that I described. Uh, so here I'm showing some graphics um, summarizing the extent to which we were able to optimize it. The first one with the apex offsets shows the time away from the apex of the elution peak that the peptide is being sampled. The majority of the peptides here shaded uh, the, the shaded part of the distribution elute within three seconds or less. And that corresponds to sampling very close to the apex. These peaks are about 20 seconds wide at the base. So that's, and because the sampling is so close to the apex, the spectra are about 95% or more pure, uh, which helps with the identification. In this case, we are able to assign confident uh, peptide sequences to about um, 35% of the analyzed peptides by, by MS2 analysis. And of course, the high spectral purity helps uh, uh, improve the quality of quantification. Now, one thing to worry about when doing single cell measurements or measurements of tiny amounts of material is that if you detect very few molecules, you may not be able to and you perfectly detect them, you count them, you may not be able to uh, use this detection to quantify their abundance in your sample. And to illustrate that, um, I'll use the analogy of sampling red and blue balls from a bucket. If I have a bucket full of red and blue balls and I ask you to sample three balls, you can, you can pick them and find two blue balls and one red. Now, from you, even though you can ascertain with absolute certainty what are the colors of these balls, you cannot use that information to accurately infer what was the, the ratio between blue and red balls, because if that ratio is 84 to, to 5, you cannot approximate 84 to 5 with, uh, uh, with any ratio of numbers between 1 and 3. Um, and more fundamentally, we can describe this problem of, of sampling very, uh, very few observations from a distribution with a Poisson distribution. In fact, it maps perfectly to, to the Poisson distribution. And that represents a major hurdle for most types of single cell analysis because uh, we rarely sample all of the molecules. If we sample only a subset, that subset should be large enough to result in representative estimate of the abundances. Currently, for single cell RNA sequencing, that is one of the major uh, bottlenecks for, for their accuracy. Even the most efficient methods sample about 20% with 20% efficiency messenger RNAs. And because messenger RNAs uh, tend to be uh, lowly abundant, so on average 17 copies per cell or fewer, that low sampling efficiency results in fairly large counting errors. And this is even in the case when the rest of sample preparation, sequencing, data analysis, and everything else is perfect. The thing that is quite helpful with uh, analyzing proteins is that proteins are much more abundant. And even if we have a hundredfold lower efficiency in sampling them, uh, we might still sample more copies per protein, which might result in having less counting noise in estimating their abundance. So that was the theory. That's something that we proposed long before we could actually estimate what the, what the sampling efficiency is. And the gratifying part is that when we get around to estimate the copy numbers that are being sampled per protein per single cell um, by, by the described methods, 
we found that uh, that corresponds to about 100 uh, copies per single cell, which uh, corresponds to relatively small counting error, not negligible, but relatively small, and compares very favorably to the copy number sampled by uh, 10x genomics, the state-of-the-art state of the art single cell RNA sequencing method, uh, that uh, uh, even, even when implemented optimally has about 50% counting uh, error in, in, in our case. So the, the ability to sample multiple copies per protein results in um, relatively good quantification uh, shown here to the right. Uh, the way we are benchmark, benchmarking quantification here is by estimating the relative protein levels uh, for proteins between monocytes and macrophages, uh, estimated by conventional well-validated bulk methods, and then doing the same relative protein estimates by in silico averaging out protein abundances within monocytes, averaging out the same abundances within macrophages and then taking the ratio. And these data allowed us to quantify about 3,000 proteins, a little bit fewer than that, across over 1,000 cells. And if we just project these data into the axis of their principal components, uh, we see two clusters because during the sorting process we knew whether a single cell was monocyte or macrophage, we can color code each cell by its identity. And we see that the clusters correspond to, to the uh, different cell types, as one would have hoped. Uh, similarly, we can color code now each single cell based on the abundance of proteins that are either um, monocyte or macrophage markers. And we see that this coloring scheme uh, shown to the right, again, um, ident uh, indicates that the two clusters correspond to the two different cell types. Now, one reaction that the reviewers had uh, on seeing this was that perhaps the separation is being driven mostly by some highly abundant proteins, while the proteins that correspond to regulatory functions are not well quantified. And we could very easily evaluate this concern quite directly by limiting our analysis just to proteins such as transcription factors, kinase, and receptors, and see whether we can still identify the clusters and what is the accuracy of their quantification specifically. And as shown here, both such regulatory proteins, as well as the least abundant proteins in our data set, uh, tend to be quantified reasonably well and allow um, separating the, the different cell types. Uh, the next thing that we did was to use spectral clustering, which is a method that allows um, to uh, identify um, structure within the data, uh, subclustering, without assuming that they're distinct clusters. Essentially, the way this works is that we, we can use a similarity, pairwise similarity between different single cells to build a graph, and then the eigenvector of the location of that graph um, is being used to sort out single cells, basically permute their orders. Here, each column corresponds to a single cell. And when we do this analysis, we see that the distribution of the elements of the eigenvector is mostly bimodal, and the clusters fall into, and, and the, the continuum, while not being entirely discrete falls within uh, two in, in, within two modes uh, with uh, the proteins being enriched in each cell type in this case here within the, the monocytes we can see uh, what proteins are more abundant and these proteins tend to function within ribosome biogenesis and cell division which makes sense because monocytes are actively dividing proliferating while macrophages are postmitotic mostly they, they don't divide as actively while in the case of macrophage cells, we see enrichment for uh, proteins with immune functions and particularly proteins participating in cell adhesion, which makes sense because macrophages are adhesion cells, they adhere. And interestingly, when we apply this exact same analysis just to the macrophages, we see that there is a continuum of heterogeneity between the single cells uh, with uh, much, much less bimodal distribution of the elements of the 
uh, eigenvector of the of the Laplacian matrix. So you can see this more quantitatively here with the distributions plotted at the bottom, uh, with the eigenvector corresponding to the whole population being clearly by model, one mode corresponding to monocytes, the other to macrophages, while the macrophage-like cells um, show uh, have a unimodal distribution. Now, what, what's this heterogeneity that we still observe within the macrophages? Of course, one possibility would be that it's just noise, even though it doesn't look uh, as a noisy pattern, it looks more like um, uh, more like a general trend within the different single cells. So one way to begin to ask and learn about uh, what it might correspond to is by looking at the functions of the proteins enriched in each end of the spectrum and throughout the continuum. So to do that, we looked at genes that had been previously as, uh, annotated to either M1 or M2 polarization of macrophages, and we found that the abundance of the proteins corresponding to these genes is very, very strongly correlated to the gradient of polarization, with M1 genes being strongly enriched in the left continuum, in the left end of the spectrum, and uh, their abundance gradually decreasing, and the opposite trend being uh, observed for the M2 or the uh, anti-inflammatory macrophages. And then, of course, we um, wanted to compare the protein measurements to the RNA measurements and evaluate the degree to which they're similar or different and what we can learn from one and the other. So to this end, we performed correlation vector analysis to compare, uh, to identify genes that have similar uh, responses at both the protein and the RNA level and genes that uh, differ in their response at the protein and the RNA level. Based on this analysis, we see that the majority of genes, over a thousand genes, have qualitatively, if not, if not quantitatively, at least qualitatively similar responses between the monocytes and the macrophages, as shown here in panel C, while a smaller group of genes, a bit over 300 genes, uh, show the opposite response at the RNA and the protein level, with many genes not, being, not changing significantly between the monocytes and the macrophages. Now, considering the uh, different copy numbers being counted for the proteins and for the RNAs. Uh, we were particularly interested to see what is the overall variability in the, in the data. So to do that, we projected the data into a joint low-dimensional manifold using CONUS, an algorithm recently developed for projecting different single-cell RNA data sets into the same low-dimensional manifold, but could be easily generalized to work with protein data as well. And as you can see here in panel D, the, uh, the joint projection is still composed of two clusters, but the protein data form the cores of these clusters, while the RNA data is more diffused around them, seeming to have more variability. Uh, quite importantly, we could see that this projection has been able to eliminate batch effects between the different clusters for, for purposes of benchmarking and validation. We had both multiple biological and technical replicates within the data, and we can see that these biological and technical replicates are uniformly dispersed within the clusters, showing that batch effects and biases, uh, whatever they were, uh, could, be easily, could be corrected for. And again, using marker genes, uh, we can uh, easily identify the, the, two, the two different cell types in, in our data. Now, I want to come back to this observation of having observed more variability uh, in the RNA data compared to the protein data, because it's potentially important. We don't fully understand it. We don't know what's contributing to, to it entirely. It could, be, uh, it could be driven by having more technical noise because of uh, counting small copy number of RNA molecules in the RNA data. It could be related to having more biological variability among messenger RNAs because of stochastic transcription. It is known that many messenger RNAs get transcribed in bursts, and 
proteins being much longer lived tend to average out that variability and there might be less biological variability at the level of the proteins. But we couldn't uh, infer just from the low dimensional joint projection that uh, there is less variability because that captures only a fraction of the variance in the total data set and can be misleading. And that's an important thing for you to, to learn and, and transfer to, to your work that uh, low dimensional uh, projections, visualizations, manifolds can be very useful for depicting data and for, uh, for visualization, but they can be also highly misleading. So it's important to conduct different types of analysis that can independently uh, confirm or invalidate the observation without making some of the approximations of the low dimensional projection. So in this case, we simply used pairwise similarity between the proteomes of single cells and the transcriptomes of single cells to measure their similarity or differences. So we computed all pairwise correlations between all single cells at either RNA or protein level and plot these distributions for both the monocytes and the macrophages. And what you can see here is that the correlations among the proteins are indeed higher, uh, so, which is consistent in this case with the low dimensional projection that we see less variability between the proteins of uh, the proteomes of single cells compared to the transcriptomes. You can also see the difference between monocytes and macrophages. The, the monocytes um, have high correlation, which makes sense considering that monocytes are much more homogeneous. Uh, they, they're a more or less clonal cell line, while the macrophages, uh, as they differentiated, became more heterogeneous, and that's what uh, our previous analysis identified as well. It's just nice to see that being reflected in, in this type of uh, uh, analysis as well. So, um, uh, what, what they have shown you so far is just a small vignette, a particular application and a short description of the methods that we have started developing. But I don't want to give you the impression that this is a mature field and we have done everything that can be done. In fact, there is a lot of opportunity for further advancement of, of these methods, both in the side of sample preparation and in fact, Andrew Leduc is, is working on, on uh, one of your classmates and colleague is working in my group uh, trying to improve sample preparation, increasing its throughput, increasing the number of uh, isobaric mass tags that we have to increase multiplexing, improving chromatography, improving instrumentation. There, there are very many aspects that can be improved uh, in this type of analysis. These are just uh, early days. Um, now, I want to pause here for some questions because if we have time, I would like to spend the remaining 10-15 minutes discussing something very different and again going back to uh, one of the uh, themes in the class of learning how the scientific enterprise works and what are some of the weaknesses and, and strengths of the current publishing environment. Uh, so do you have questions for, for this part of my presentation? Hi. Oh, oh sorry. You, you go first. Okay. Hey, this is Julie. Um, so I was thinking when you were showing the original mass spec data that you could improve separation and sampling time, but I guess are there any kind of co-sensitivities that you need to be aware of as you're trying to improve one of these factors, like separation or sampling, um, reduced volume, et cetera? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by cost sensitivity, but there is no downside. If you improve separation, for example, or ionization, there is no downside associated with that. But it's quite hard to improve it because the, the, um, the factors that tend to improve separation also make the chromatography less reliable and harder. So it's fairly hard to improve that. Similarly, there, there are no substantial downsides if we, imp if, if we increase multiplexing by a factor of 10, which is going to decrease cost by a factor of 10. It's going to be a huge benefit. But it's not so easy to synthesize 10 times more isobaric mass tags. So it is not so much that there are downsides that you're facing these trade-offs. It is more that some of these technical improvements are not 
so easy to to accomplish but nonetheless they are quite feasible and doable which is what makes it exciting to try to push the technology further sure. okay thanks uh hi professor uh depends on the flow settle metry that technique if you I, I i'm thinking if that possible based on the different uh, uh, uh protein like the surface protein extraction on the metal set or the macrophage we can use the flow settle metry cell sorting to separate them Certainly, you can use flow cytometry as one of the best established longest standing methods for a single cell analysis. Uh, the issue with flow cytometry is that it mostly has to rely on antibodies to have molecular specificity, and there are a limited number of antibodies that can be labeled optically without having um, intolerable overlap between their, the emission spectra of the fluorophores. And then there's the whole issue with the the low specificity of antibodies and also the issue that we discussed of uh, perturbing the cells as we take them uh, for for analysis when antibodies bind receptors they can actually stimulate those receptors which is oftentimes used uh, for for biological experiments now if we're using the antibodies just as a way to detect these proteins, we might also inadvertently be causing stimulation of these cells, which results in downstream changes in their proteomes. Uh, but there are certainly many ways to combine these technologies that I'm describing with flow cytometry and, and use it as, as, as another dimension that is, that is useful. It is just that flow cytometry itself cannot really, at present, give us um, uh, quantification of a large number of proteins with good specificity. Okay, Professor Slava. Yeah. Uh, this is Kanika. I have a question regarding. Uh, so, uh, with with your research right now, you showed that there was heterogeneity in uh, macrophages in themselves. But would you be able to also show uh, that various cytokines can really induce uh, the change of uh, its phenotype from M1 to M2 or vice versa? Like, for instance subjecting them with you know IL-10 to change M1 phenotype to M2 phenotype so you know and then screen a variety of them to just understand which one really works in you know modulating that phenotypic change. So this is very clear that we can influence polarization of the macrophages by using cytokines it's uh, interferon gamma for example classically it's known to induce uh, M1 polarization and IL-4 induces M2 polarization. So one can certainly alter that polarization. Uh, the question is also when you alter that, it's actually interesting uh, to what extent you still have heterogeneity when this is being done and this has been done hundreds and hundreds of times. People normally would do a bulk measurement within the cells and establish that uh, there are certain markers that are increased for each cytokine and associate these with a particular polarization. I think the whole paradigm of M1, M2 polarization is really grossly oversimplified. And it's not just a single axis of polarization. There is a lot more heterogeneity mm -hmm. uh, being present. And it is very clear that that heterogeneity will be strongly influenced if we add cytokines. So in this case, uh, the model system is just used specifically to look whether there is polarization if we don't explicitly add cytokines. And then if, if we were to add a cytokine, then we can still repeat the measurements and likely we would still find heterogeneity, but now that will be different. And one has to think what is a good question to ask there and how do I design the, uh, the corresponding experiment. And especially like in terms of, you know, I mean, there is a theory which says that when, when there is inflammation, like for instance, in the gut for IBD, um, generally uh, macrophages move, like there have been studies wherein if there is a wound in the body, uh, peritoneal macrophages really move to the wound. Uh, and so I was really wondering, like, for instance, in this case, right, if, if the monocytes, um, they sort of differentiate into these, you know, anti-inflammatory macrophages in the gut, for instance, right, and then perhaps those kind of models could be, you know, formulated and studied. Absolutely. And and that would be very good to do with primary cells taken directly from, from the gut of either um, experimental animals or patients, if, if that's possible. Yeah, there is certainly the scope for doing that, that kind of analysis. Thank you.
Um, I have a couple of questions that are sort of related. Um, so you were discussing how with the scope method you have a higher copy number per cell than as compared to RNA-seq. Um, is it that you measure more per cell or that more exists per cell? And is it relative to single cell RNA-seq you're comparing? That's right. We are comparing relative to the single cell RNA sequencing for the same gene. Uh, so we okay. intersected the genes. We didn't want to compare lowly abundant genes in one side to highly abundant genes in the other side. So there are a lot uh, our capture efficiency with scope 2 is lower than for 10x genomics. 10x genomics or single cell RNA sequencing methods, they have capture efficiency between one, well, it can be less than 1%, but let's say 1 to 20% capture efficiency, sometimes it's lower. Our capture efficiency is definitely below 1%. So we capture a smaller fraction of the protein molecules in the cell, but because on average proteins are about a thousand fold more abundant than messenger right. RNA, so oftentimes more, oftentimes 10,000. So for each messenger RNA in a cell, usually they're between a thousand to 10,000 protein molecules. So because there is this much higher abundance to begin with with the proteins, even if we have lower capture efficiency, we end up detecting, accounting larger number of protein molecules per peptide per protein, and that helps reduce the counting uh, errors in estimating the abundance of the protein compared to the estimate for the abundance of the messenger RNA. Cool. So, so then, so that makes sense. So then, for the messenger RNA. Um, you know how the distribution usually used is the negative binomial, which is similar to the Poisson that you mentioned. Is there an analogous distribution that's used to model like full changes in proteomics? That like, would be this... wonderful. So, uh, great question. So, with the single cell RNA sequencing, it is well known that uh, in a good experiment, uh, the counting noise is the, one of the primary contributors to, to, to the noise in the measurement. Right. With the protein measurements, it is not clear at this point that the counting noise is our primary limitation. We, we have other aspects such as variability in sample preparation uh, and potentially coisolation that can be very substantial contributors to the noise. So the, the distribution might be different. It may not be just the counting of molecules. I think as, as the field matures, it will be very important to model that noise distribution, but uh, this is very new, uh, very early days, and nobody has actually derived uh, clearly what that noise distribution is going to be. And my expectation is that it will not be a negative binomial pulse and distribution. If we get to that point, uh, it will be phenomenal because we have the ability to further increase the sampling efficiency. And if that's our main bottleneck, um, error bars can become arbitrarily small. Uh, but for that, we would have to uh, further reduce the noise and uh, from sample preparation and co-isolation and other aspects, which is all doable, all exciting things to do. But they don't quite think we are there yet, and we certainly don't have as, uh, a good estimate for what the noise distribution is. It took a couple, so if, if you think of how this developed within the single cell yeah. RNA sequencing, uh, the, the methods became very quickly adopted by hundreds and thousands of labs, and, and the first papers publishing uh, est estimates of what the noise distribution looks like came three, four, five years down the road uh, after the first methods were developed. Cool. Um, so is there, is, what about for bulk proteomics? Is there like a distribution that people usually use? Uh, it's usually the empirical distribution is commonly used. So bulk proteomics mm -hmm. is clearly not limited by, by counting errors. It's limited by right. other errors and it's usually empirical there. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, in the last 10 minutes of the class, I'm going to very quickly return to, um, to the theme of publishing. So we have discussed that one of the, that if you want to have an impact in the public research enterprise, 
uh, your results should be shared and they should be widely known. There are more than one ways of making your results widely known and, and to share them. But one of the important ways to gain visibility and to share them is by publishing in influential journals, in elite journals. And this is particularly true in biological sciences, but also in other fields. Usually the more competitive the field, the, the more important elite journals are. And one thing that I've observed sometimes that happens is that even when one writes and publishes a purely computational paper in these journals, the model framing can be relegated to the online only methods. So it is common to, to put technical details in online only methods. Many people who may want to use the method may not want to be immediately confronted with details of the implementation. But at least conceptually, what is the base of the model and how it works should be introduced in the paper. Because if the thing is relegated to online only methods, who knows who reads it? Maybe the reviewers never read it. And I, I, I have certainly come across a number of such examples. Here I'm going to share one of them uh, of a recent Nature Bio Biotechnology paper, where after reading the paper, I did not know what the method is actually doing because the, the paper doesn't describe it. And then I went to the online only method to see what the method actually is, how it's being framed. And the paper was trying to project into the same space single cells measured as part of different single cell RNA sequencing data sets. So here to the, to the right, I'm showing the two matrices, one blue, one red, that have single cell RNA sequencing data. They, they should be projected into the same space. And then when I try to understand something, I think of what the corresponding math corresponds to. So here uh, we have the matrices, the blue is X and the, the red is Y. Uh, here I have them labeled. So the method is being formulated as multiplying the blue matrix with, with this blue vector uh, transposed horizontal vector on the left. And the red matrix is also multiplied by a horizontal vector on the left. And then the resulting vectors here um, will be correlated. Now the problem is that this first equation formulating the problem formulates it in such a way that it's not possible to compute generally. Why will that be the case? Because when you do these multiplications here with the blue matrix, you will end up with a horizontal vector whose number of elements equal to the number of cells in this data set. You do the same operation for the red matrix and you get another vector whose number of elements equals the number of cells in the red data set. And the two data sets may not even have the same number of cells. You cannot possibly correlate these vectors. It's just not defined linear algebra operation. And if somehow you were you happen to have the same number of single cells in these data sets, uh, the correlation is not likely to be meaningful because the single cells would usually be ordered in an, in an arbitrary way. Uh, so why why did I pick this particular example out of the many other examples that I could have picked? Because when I brought this example to the attention of the senior author, the senior author told me that uh, uh, he will ask the graduate student who did the work and never get back to me. And uh, I felt that this is particularly inappropriate because the senior and corresponding author would normally take the responsibility for such a thing. And this is clearly not something about an experiment done by a student in, in a way that the PI doesn't know. But it's something that simply by looking at, at the contents of the paper one and knowing linear algebra, one can immediately see that, that there is an issue with the formulation of this problem. It's also emblematic of the kind of problems that arise if something is being relegated to supplementary information. Uh, because that alone might signal that uh, perhaps it's not as important and the framing of the problem is important in my opinion and it can also result in lower probability of reviewers being able to catch it because maybe they didn't peruse uh, online only methods. So I don't mean to despair and to say that 
this makes publishing useless and that the system is broken no the system is working to a degree it's certainly suboptimal and has many problems but to to avoid that and to help minimize the probability of those things happening i think it's very important to include equations especially important equations in the main text of, of your papers and if it's very hard to validate your results empirically as it's often the case with single cell measurements because there isn't another orthogonal measurement usually that you can easily do then it's even more important that computational algorithms be very carefully examined um, and of course all of that can work if the scientists and engineers uh, are uh, are well educated and have the required skills to understand methods. Uh, you shouldn't use algorithms and methods as black boxes. I put in my data, I get the plot and I include it into my paper. You should really understand what uh, what that algorithm is doing. And ultimately that has to be done as a community effort by, by everybody. Uh, so I'm gonna finish with that, my presentation, uh, thanking uh, 